Well, n nowadays, uh, we, people describe uh, the world we live in as the age of post-truth. We live in a post-modern age and a post-Christian age and a post-secular age and post-religious age, post-human age. And uh, lately, uh, what a lot of people call post-truth. Um, the, the philosophers who thought about the internet, and they do, uh, thought that it would be emancipatory. They thought it would be a great boon. And um, it would allow uh, displaced and marginalized people to um, have their say. They, it would be able to get into closed countries where a, the state controlled all information and uh, bring the word of democracy t into into authoritarian worlds. What they didn't see coming was that it allowed everybody to say whatever was on their mind. And the result has been, um, I don't know how, you would, how you'd weigh it, but at least as deleterious as emancipatory because it's allowed people to form little cabals and circles in which they communicate only among themselves and they circulate whatever they want. Um, and it goes uh, unchallenged inside their little uh, camp. Um, we've also hit a state of public discourse where people feel free to say anything, to make up information as they go along to, to simply lie in public. And knowing that it will, that there's a, that there's a, a, a ready-made audience for that, that kind of talk. The, the sort of epitome of all this, the thing that uh, has, has gotten the most traction uh, in this regard is, is Kelly and Conway's famous declaration of alternate facts. So you have your facts, I have my facts. We, we present alternate facts. And what, uh, if, that, if that simply goes uncriticized, then what you've got is a, is a rampant relativism. That is to say, uh, a notion that really that anything goes. Think of relativism that way. Anything goes. Now, the response to relativism, the knee-jerk response to relativism is absolutism. That is to say, that there are absolutely true, there are absolute truths out there. There is, abs there is pure, objective, absolute truth. Now, the problem with that is that the, the, the invocation of absolute truth is never far from violence. It is, you only have to think of fundamentalist religions, okay. not only Christian fundamentalism, but Islamic, or Jewish, or Buddhist. I mean, you've even got Buddhists in Myanmar slaughtering Muslims. Hindu fundamentalism, re religious fundamentalism is a form of absolutism. And uh, it is never far from violence. Now, my proposal is that absolute, that making the distinction between absolute and relative, staging a battle between absolutism and relativism is not a good idea. It, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's in fact a dangerous idea. It's, it's calculated to produce conflict 
and, uh, and is never far from violence. Um, it's also philosophically, I think, a mistake. So what I want to do is two things. One, show what I think is wrong with this distinction be between ab what's absolutely true and anything goes, between absolutism and relativism, what I think is wrong with that, and w how I would replace it, what I would replace it with. That is, I think there's another more felicitous distinction that um, would, would keep us out of trouble and it also makes more sense. Now that I'm going to call interpretation, the theory of interpretation, the, which goes under the name in philosophy of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation, the art the theory of the art of interpretation, you might say. And let's put it this way. In the theory of our interpretation, the, the, arg the, the claim is there are no uninterpreted facts. There are no uninterpreted facts. There are no pure facts. Now, that sounds like a little bit like relativism, right? And the second thing that goes along with saying that is some interpretations are better than others. So there's a kind of two-pronged claim here. There are no uninterpreted facts, and some interpretations are better than others. And you can say hermeneutics sort of stands or falls on those two claims which belong together. You can't separate them. All right, for example, suppose I said to you, how many facts are there in this room right now? Yeah. yeah this is, this is, not only is there an infinite amount, it's, it's actually even worse than that. I mean, that's actually true. I think there, there would be an infinite amount. In a certain sense, the, the, other, the other way of putting the same point is it, the, the question doesn't make any sense. It's an incomplete thought. Why? Because you're not supplying a frame that picks out the facts. Facts are a function of the framework that picks out the facts. So if you say, how many chairs are there in this room? How many people are there in this room? How many lights are there in this room? Then you've got a clear frame. The frame picks, picks out the fact. It's like doing a computer search. You set up a framework that can conduct the search, and then it can produce results. Facts and fictions are not quite as far apart as we think, because facts have to be produced. Facts have to be generated by interpretive frameworks. So an interpretation sets up a framework that allows you to pick out what you're looking for what you need. If you don't have a framework, if you don't have an interpretive horizon, you can't proceed. An uninterpreted, so the notion of an uninterpreted fact actually makes no sense. It, it's like and, and trying to answer the question, how many facts are there in this room? An interpretation is an angle. It's, it's like an access ramp. It, it, it limits you if you have an interpretation 
but it also gives you access. If you want to know what a pure, uninterpreted fact looks like, I've often seen it on the faces of students who came into my office and said, I don't know what I want to write my paper on. I, I don't know what to do. What's the problem? No angle. No access. No perspective. The opposite of an interpretation is not a pure fact. The opposite of an interpretation is a blank stare. It's just blank. Nothing's coming up. It's like searching for something, but you don't tell what. You don't tell the computer what to search for. It's just blank. Interpretations frame and shape facts, information, knowledge. They, they are angles of entry. And they can be too slow. And like, think, think of a, think of a, of a, uh, uh, a ship, a spaceship that has to re-enter the atmosphere. And it has to do it at exactly the right angle. If, it's too, if, it's, if the angle's wrong, it'll burn up. Well, in interpretations like that, it gives you, it gives you an angle that lights, this, lights up the, the situation. And if it, it, it could be right or wrong. It could be too sharp, and then it, it burns up. An, interp an interpretation, so interpretations are either good or bad. They're, some are better than others. Some interpretations are unconfirmed, contrived, uh, invidious, unfruitful. Some interpretations are predictive, widely confirmed. A community of interpreters fall, uh, assemble around it. Some interpretations are better than others. But there is no uninterpreted fact out there. Another way to put it is to say, to understand is to understand as. To, to, take, to, to grasp something is to grasp it as this or that. You can't simply grasp it. You have to have, to have a concept, for example, literally means to be able to grasp something. To be able to get it, get your head around it, we say, it means that to know how to take it. the The problem when when we go to read a book that is uh, strange to us, or or try to understand uh, an historical period that is strange to us, or a work of art, or a poem, or anything. The problem is not to come to it with a purely open mind. The problem is, so, so the problem is not to, to somehow or another be able to be without presuppositions when we come to the thing. The problem is the opposite. It's not having enough presuppositions. If you want to read a Greek tragedy, you need a whole apparatus of presuppositions, of interpretive, fra uh, a complicated interpretive framework, because it's a different world. It's not like going to a Broadway show. It's not like watching a film. It's a different world. So you need to know all sorts of things about that world. If you want to read 
the Bible. Let me say, what does the Bible say? Well, nothing. Put it in front of you, open it up, sit down, and listen. Doesn't say anything. You've got to read it. Ah, as soon as you start reading, you're up to your ears in interpretation. In order to understand the Bible, you need to know all kinds of things. Have you ever seen a fig tree? Have you ever seen any things that are in the New Testament that they talk about? It's a different world. It's rural. It's 2,000 years ago. Furthermore, you're reading a translation. And the translation's a translation. Even if you could read, say, the New Testament in Greek, that's a translation. Why? Because, well, for one thing, you're dealing with a text that has been reconstituted over, over 2,000 years. We don't have any original, manus original manuscripts. And even if you had an original manuscript, that still would be the, uh, 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 an interpretation and a translation because Jesus didn't speak in Greek. The whole thing's written in Greek, but he didn't know a word of Greek. He spoke Aramaic. The whole thing's a translation. The whole thing's an interpretation. Some interpretations are better than others. So you distinguish between the, the scriptures that the church has decided are legitimate and the things that they call apocryphal. Some interpretations are better than others. We mostly read it in an English translation. How good is the translation? See how crazy fundamentalism is? Fundamentalism, you pick up, for the most part, fundamentalists are, are dealing with English translations of texts of the, that are themselves translations, which are themselves interpretations of something. What's underneath an interpretation is not a fact. What's underneath an interpretation is a deeper level of interpretation. If you keep peeling off the levels of interpretation, you'll, get to, you'll just simply get to, to more deep set, more fundamental interpretations. Interpretation goes all the way down. But some interpretations are better than others. That's why you have uh, methods and rules of interpretation. If you want to major in history, there are, you need to be trained in the methods of historical research. Why? Because historical study is interpretation all the way down. You've only got so many materials from the past, you've got to figure out how they hang together, you've got to worry about what, all the stuff you don't know. And, and there are rules for doing that. The basic rule in historical interpretation is to avoid anachronism. anachronism. Anachronism is the mortal sin of historical interpretation. It's assuming that things then are like they are now. Pre-technological pre world. Go all the way back to the, to the Greeks and you've got a world that's even more profoundly different. There are no uninterpreted facts of the matter. Now, what does it mean to say that something is true? Well, the most practical definition of truth, that, tr truth, in the, truth, truth in, the, in the pure sense means to say, of, you go back to Aristotle, to say of what is, that it is. And of what is not, that it is not. Good. That's fine. Notice, though, that you're saying to say of what is, that it is. In other words, it, it involves intelligence, it involves a mind, it involves speaking. It's not a mute object out there. Suppose the, the 
universe, as far as we know, the best interpretation we have right now is that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. All right, let's go back, say, uh, just one billion years. There are no living intelligent beings in the universe. The, the physical conditions to, to support life don't exist yet. Was there any truth in such a world? Can't be. What's truth? To say of what is that it is and of what is not. There, was no, there were no, no people around to say anything. Truth is a relationship between consciousness, or mind, and reality. It's that point where they meet. And in a way, they never don't meet. I mean, the only time that they wouldn't meet is when we, either when we don't exist or when we're unconscious. And even when we're unconscious, we're still in a dream world. So there was still some, some remnant of a reality, even in our dreams. Our dreams are, and when we dream, we dream of things that come from, a, from our experience. So truth is a relationship. And it's a relationship which is uh, in which we've got the right angle, the best angle on things. All right. Now think of the notion of absolute truth. What the word absolute means, absolved from all limitations, conditions, circumstances, perspectives. And that would mean absolve. Absolute truth means a truth which is absolved from all of the conditions under which truth is possible to begin with. The notion of absolute truth means we've removed all the conditions under which it would be possible to know the truth. Therefore, what? No such thing. Well, maybe you could say there is, but it's only possible for God. Why? Because God could, is not subject to those conditions. So God, who in classical theology is an absolutely eternal and omniscient being, God has absolute truth. But for us, absolute truth is absolutely impossible. Well, you say, well, isn't that absolutely true, that it's absolutely true, that we're cut off absolutely from absolute truth? Well, you say, yeah, that's, that's pretty true. The word, so what does the word absolutely do? It, well, one of the things it does is mean decisive. You say, I absolutely am going to major in philosophy. That's where all the money is in philosophy. Absolutely going to major in philosophy. What does that mean? That means uh, for sure. So it has a, or something is absolutely ridiculous. So, absolutely, so the word absolutely has an emphatic sense. It's absolutely the, the case. It means in this context, I'm re it, this is very likely to happen. There's another way of putting the theory of hermeneutics. The, the theory of hermeneutics, what, what hermeneutics says is there, everything has a context. When you ask for the meaning of the word, what you basically do is you look through the 
uh, range of the possible uses it would have in various contexts. And if you could sort of sort out, if you could collect, like a, dic like a great dictionary, all the possible uses, all the possible contexts in which that word would function, then you'd have a pretty good idea what it means. It's, it has a collection of uses. Uh, it a word belongs to a context. Every time we know something, we're in a context. We're in a particular part of space, a particular part of time, in a particular body, a gender, a language. Descartes. Did, has anybody done Descartes in class yet? Doubting, doubting everything in order to find what's indubitable? The one, th one thing he didn't doubt was the language he was using, which enabled him to perform the doubt. He took a great deal of uh, knowledge of philosophy and knowledge of the Latin language in which he was writing in order to do what he was doing. It took a whole host of, host of things that he had to presuppose in order to undertake the doubt. What? He's operating in the context. And when you look back at his work, you can say, oh, this is the work of a Frenchman in the 17th century, writing in Latin. We can do it. He's completely circumscribed by his context. He's inherited things that he's learned when he went to that Jesuit school when he was a student. He's got all kinds of century, 17th century stuff in his head. It's, context. it's contextual. To say that knowledge is interpretive is to say that knowledge is contextual, which means that you can never absolve yourself from it. Which means that the notion of absolute truth is either absolutely impossible for us, or it's something that you would attribute to God, and therefore it has a kind of edifying use, and, and which a very useful edifying use, and that is not to confuse ourselves with God. The, the problem with absolutism is it, can, it we confuse is its tendency to confuse ourselves with God. So we're looking the fact that we're looking upon God or thinking about God, who is absolute, doesn't make what we're saying or thinking absolute. No more than looking at a tree makes us tree-like or seeing something brown or green turns us brown or green. The absoluteness of God, if that's what God is, not everybody thinks the same thing about God, doesn't make us absolute. And the, the basic sin of idolatry in the Bible is the confusion of the two, confusing ourselves with God, and what, that's what happens with, in religious fundamentalism. People confuse themselves with God. They're talking about something about absolute, but they're not talking about it absolutely. Right? So there's a, there's a kind of moral lesson in the, in the word absolute. Don't confuse yourself with anything absolute. Understand your limitations. There was a famous philosopher named Lessing in the, in the 19th century who said, if God, held out to me in his right hand absolute truth and in his left hand the search for truth I would choose the left hand and I would say the absolute truth is for thee alone O Lord that's the human condition that's that's that, that's that's um, the inescapable characteristic of our existence, our, our finitude, which is our access. To have a mind is to be open on to the world. But to be open on to the world is to be open on to the world from a certain angle. So what does it mean to have the truth? It means to have the best available interpretation at the moment. It's, it's to have a sort of state-of-the-art grasp on things. Knowing that tomorrow morning everything may change. We hope it doesn't. And, and if that happened every morning, there would be chaos. So 
So, abso so absolute truth is at best some kind of abstract ideal for us. You, you might say from a human point of view, the truth is the totality of every possible interpretation. And that's why what you said originally about the, an infinite number of facts. Well, so it's not exactly an infinite number of facts, it's an infinite number of interpretations. So if you knew the totality of all possible interpretations, that would be something like the fullness of truth. But that would take an infinite amount of time. That's the advantage God has in this situation. God is outside of time, and so God understands everything immediately, totally, and comprehensively. OK. Now, if that's the case, then, if, if there's all these things wrong with the distinction between the absolute and relative, if the absolute is just beyond us, and if relativism is chaos, what should we put in its place? Well, I would recommend the following. And I'll give you three different versions of it. It's all the same basic idea. You know this notion of a paradigm shift? What's that? You can speak, don't be afraid to just speak up here. What's a paradigm shift? It's a, common, it's a common expression. It's a philosophical idea, but it's made itself into, into ordinary language. Yes? It's uh, kind of like when your whole way of doing things or understanding something changes. And in the language that we're using here today, when the basic framework of interpretation shifts, the basic framework. All right, now. There was a guy named Thomas Kuhn who wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. How are we doing here? Okay. Wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions back in a long time ago, actually, now, back in the 1962. And he said, he challenged the, the, the received idea of the history of science. He was a historian of science but he was also a, a philosopher of science. So he was interested in philosophically answering the question, what is scientific knowledge like? And he, but he, he approached it by studying the history of science. And the received view at the time was, this, uh, science undergoes a gradual, incremental uh, change as new information, new experimental information comes in. So we keep completing, the picture keeps getting more and more complete. And it moves steadily, it progresses in a steady, linear way. Because it, it, it begins with experimental information and it just keeps adding on more and more experimental information until finally it, gets, it becomes more and more comprehensive. And Kuhn says, well, you know, if you actually look at the history of science, it doesn't work like that. What happens in the history of science is it works like that for, for, for long stretches until somebody comes along and says something utterly new, totally baffling, extremely suggestive, unconfirmed because it's new, gets sets the hair on fire of the senior, old senior professors, gets the graduate students all worked up because they think this is the new, this is what's coming, and either turns out to be crazy and goes away, or changes the history of physics fundamentally. So, and then he was in particular interested in the Copernican world view, in, in Copernicus, and what happened when, with Copernicus's own uh, theory of uh, heliocentric theory. And he said, there wasn't any new information out there. They, they knew the, the, the astronomy that went all the way back to Ptolemy had acquired an enormous amount of information about the, the movement of the stars and the planets. They knew really a lot about the movement of the stars and the planets. 
And they weren't wrong. They could predict the movements of the stars and the planets. What was wrong with it? It was ridiculously complicated. And everything seemed to move pretty regularly, except the planets, which seemed really weird. It had squiggly movements, which is what the word planet in Greek, the word planet goes back to a Greek word meaning to wander, because it didn't move the way the sun and the stars did. And Copernicus said, you know, it would be a lot simpler if we just assumed that the sun was motionless, it was motionless and we're moving around the sun. The math is simpler. And suddenly, everything fell into place. He, he simply shifted our presuppositions in an elemental way. He didn't come up with any new observations about Mars. He didn't have any new experimental evidence to offer. He just said, uh, look how simple, much simpler it is. It was like, in fact, he, he, because he didn't want to get in, into Dutch with the church, he was, a, he, was a, uh, he, was a, he was actually a monk. He said, well, you know, treat this the way a, math, a mathematics teacher would treat um, the, the way a math teacher would give the students a simpler solution, a, a shortcut. You'll get the same results if you follow the shortcut. The full proof is, is a lot more complicated, but if you actually do it this way, it's a lot shorter. And so Copernicus said, assume the sun is still, and it's a lot easier to do. And then this actually had those very practical consequences because it made it easier for mariners who didn't have to go through co complicated calculations to track the stars when they were out in the, at night in the sea. Fundamental, transforming, revisioning of the heavens. Totally appalling to common sense to think that we are moving. The greatest astronomer of the day, the guy who had all the money, all the graduate students, all the university resources, was a guy named Tycho Brahe. And, and Brahe said, this is brilliant. What Copernicus says is brilliant, <coughs> but it can't be true. Why? Because we're, we're, we're not moving. Just look. We're not going anywhere. The Earth is terra firma. We can't be moving. Everything else is moving. And so he says, I'll give Copernicus this much. Everything else moves around the sun except us. The sun and everything else, everything else moves around the sun, but the sun and everything else is moving around us. <laughs> it was the, the dual centric theory, two different centers. And that just proved to be proved to be, eventually proved to be, fruitless. And the old theory just said, now at that moment when Copernicus said what he said, all the, all the empirical evidence was for, for Ptolemy. But he said, look, think about it differently. That is to say, reinterpret it. And you go through the history of science, Thomas Kuhn said, and you'll see that happen again and again and again. Louis Pasteur, everybody thought he was crazy. He said we were covered with bugs. And if you wanted to keep yourself healthy, you should wash your hands. And if you're going to have any kind of surgery, wash your hands. Because we're covered with bacteria. Everybody thought he was completely crazy. But he totally reimagined chemistry and biology. 1905, this guy who couldn't find a job, who worked in a patent office, wrote four articles that changed the history of physics. Einstein.
There was a wonderful series called on one of the cable stations called Genius, and they did a uh, the life of uh, Einstein, and it was marvelous to see the utter disbelief with which Einstein's views were were offered or were received. All the evidence was for the old science. So the business of simply experimentally accumulating experimental evidence proved to be that's not the way it works. What happens is interpretive schema that change everything are put in place. Then what happens? Well, then a whole community of people group around that interpretive schema until the next guy with a with a PhD but who can't get a job and is working in a patent office comes up with some new revolutionary schema. So Einstein resisted all kinds of new things that came along after him. He had severe doubts about quantum physics, for example, and some of the things that were being said about quantum physics. Now notice the interesting thing about this, this schema. It doesn't just apply to physics. As a matter of fact, you might even think it wouldn't apply to physics at all because it sounds more like what happens in art. So you have Renaissance art, which discovers the principle of, collective, of, of perspective, transforms old medieval art, makes it look like folk art. Picasso, or Impressionism, transforms representational art. Picasso comes along with an utterly new schema for the representation, uh, for, for, for pictorial representation, transforms everything. And what happens to those things? They're either considered to be crazy or they change everything. Sometimes they are just crazy. Sometimes they're erratic. So Kuhn says, Kuhn makes this distinction between normal science and revolutionary science, and that I think is what is the best way to is is, the, is what I would replace the absolute relative schema with. He says in normal science there's a received paradigm. Everybody in the scientific community, all the graduate students being trained by the full professors, are learning the received method. They're learning what we call today the standard model. And they get better and better at it. Until we run into what Kuhn calls an anomaly. Now, most anomalies can be resolved. Most anomalies turn out to be exceptions to higher rules that we didn't know about. But every once in a while, an anomaly is really an anomaly, and it throws the whole thing askew. And it, pro it produces a scientific revolution. Now, in those moments of revolutionary change, say when Copernicus proposes his schema, when Einstein writes the, the papers on relativity, the scientific community is at a loss. It's got no method to fall back on because the revolution is challenging the old method. So you've got these moments of ambiguity and indecision which ultimately depend upon insight, that is to say, ultimately depend upon interpretive skill. We've got an interpretation which is going to throw new light on the situation and open it up in a completely new way. And the history of science is it moves between normal science and revolutionary science. And in times of revolutionary science, we don't know what to do. And that, that ambiguity has to be resolved. Same thing's true in the history of art. When, when Picasso first started producing Cubist paintings, they were ridiculed. The art critics didn't know what to do. Why? Because the rules that operated during the previous period when there was stability were being challenged. One uh, French philosopher named Lyotard put it in a very nice way, and it, was, it sort of sums things up crisply. 
He said, he made a distinction between making a new move in an old game and inventing a new game altogether. So suppose tomorrow morning we read that somebody has just discovered a new play by Shakespeare. Hitherto lost. Just discovered it. What would that do? what would that represent? It would it would represent new it would represent new information in t inside the existing framework of Shakespearean of the world of Shakespearean scholarship. So the existing framework would be improved. But it wouldn't be shaken. It wouldn't be thrown out. It wouldn't be a revolutionary change. It would be something new, an, a new move in an existing game, in an old game. Or we discover a new novel by Jane Austen. But what happens when someone like James Joyce comes along and writes Ulysses? What's that? The, the sign of a, of a paradigm shift is that the practitioners in the field are saying, that's not science. That's not art. That's not painting. That's not a novel. Yes, it is. It's just a revolutionary shift. It's a paradigm shift. So what's truth? Truth is the most commonly received best consensus we can reach on a given subject. Most of the time, we're operating in normal science with received paradigms. But once in a while, we hit revolutionary periods when somebody invents a new game altogether. Now, we can't be too fast to throw out the, the standard model, because it will be chaos if we do that. And we can't be closed off to the anomaly, to the thing that is shocking to us, to the thing that looks like it makes no sense, to the thing that we're, we're inclined to say, that's not whatever we're talking about, religion, art, science, whatever. So we have to cultivate to, to be truthful. We have to understand there are standards. And those standards get tested. And they get confirmed. And we reach a certain consensus. But we have to remain open to the possibility that everything will be different. Is consensus the final goal? I don't think so. I think consensus is a provisional state. We want to get as far as consensus because we want confirmation and we want things to be tested. And we want intersubjective agreement. But if we ever got pure consensus, it would freeze up. Consensus is like a frozen waterfall, you know, if you absolutize it. It's something that's supposed to be moving that has frozen. So the consensus always has to be structurally in principle, exposed to dissent. So tr truth is a movement between consensus and dissent, between normal, standard, received understandings and the possibility of something new. It's never nailed down. It's always open. In hermeneutics, you say, things don't have an essence. 
They have a history. And whenever we want to say this is the essence of something, we're usually freezing the history. So you look at the history of, of human institutions, and when, when people talk about human nature, what, what they're doing is freeze, fr freeze framing. They're, they're stopping a process. And if you ever did that, you would never have progress. You wouldn't, when, when the Constitution says all, all men are created equal, it, they really meant that. They meant men, and they meant land owning men. And they said that's the order of nature. It was the order of nature that women and slaves were inferior to men. That goes all the way back to the Greeks. So in hermeneutics, things don't have an essence. They have a history. Truth is, is, truth is the best take we have on things. Recognizing its, its structural vulnerability to being transformed. So we always defer what's being offered with the right hand of God, absolute truth. That's an illusion. Lessing was right about that. That's an illusion. The human situation is the ongoing movement, the process, the history, the search, the which called the love of knowledge, not knowledge proper. All right, that's that's uh, enough to uh, for one one talk. Um, why don't we take some time now? Because it's only it's only five thirty. We got some time for discussion and so questions and objections, sh shrieks of horror, protests. Yes. So I was, I guess I was just kind of wondering, what is kind of like the practical difference between this idea of that there are interpretations and that those interpretations are either better or worse, can be better or worse, and the idea that there's, you know, what you would call the absolutism, that there's absolutism and that we either know it well or we don't know it as well, the, the absolute truth. Well, the absolute, if you, if you lay claim to something absolute, then you're sort of taking it out of history. You're, you're, you're making it irreformable. And um, you're um, un, unwilling to uh, uh, amend or, or repeal with something that's absolutely true. Whereas with the notion of what Kuhn calls normal science or the received paradigm or the, the, the consensus view, you're always saying, this is this is the best this is the state of the art. This is what we think is going on. And um, that will turn out to be true, but not quite as true or in quite the same way as you thought. So like what what Newton said, the measurements that Newton made are like the measurements that the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic astronomers made. They didn't turn out to be wrong. They just belong to a wider and different context, which gave them a whole new significance. And so the basic difference is repealability, amendability, uh, fallibility, the recognition of um, the, the the recognition that an interpretation is an interpretation. Absolute truth is an interpretation that forgets it is an interpretation. And therefore, it takes itself to be unappealable or unrepealable. What we think we know is always repealable, appealable, amendable, refinable, falsifiable. Falsifiable. Uh, there's a, a man named Karl Popper who, who said that in science, you never, you never verify anything. You just keep falsifying things. So that you're you're making progress, but you're making progress by showing well that's not tr that's not what what we thought was true is actually not right. It's this way, but and then what we say is now what we say is true. Well, well the same thing is going to happen. So there's a, it's an essential re repealability about it, or, or falsifiability about it. What's ultimately true is a head. The truth is a head. 
we're, we're there. You can't not be in the truth. We, we live and move and have our being, as St. Paul says, in the truth, because otherwise we would, we would perish. But, but our take on the truth is always finite, as long as we're in time. The only way you could actually escape any of this is if you were an eternal being. But as long as you're in time and history, then things are shaped historically, contextually, interpretably, within frameworks which change. It's the risk of uh, being alive, being in time. So, suppose I say, now you've just heard one hour of pure truth. Now suppose I say, there are alternate facts. Suppose I invoke the notion of alternate facts. What's wrong with, with that? We're speaking of alternate facts. Are there alternate facts? Well, there are alternate interpretations, right? There's a conflict of interpretations. There are alternate interpretations of facts. But once you've got a framework and you've got consensus, then that world is relatively stable. If it weren't rel relatively stable, it'd be chaos. James Joyce had a great, coined a great word for this. He's, he said, on the one hand, you, we like to think in terms of cosmos, which is pure order. But if there was pure order, there would be no, nothing would ever be new. Nothing new would ever happen because everything would be run by rules. The opposite of pure order is chaos, right? So James Joyce coins, coins the word chaosmos. Chaosmos, what's that? It's a kind of uh, optimal disequilibrium. You know? It's disequilibrium because it's not pure order, it's not pure rules. It's not absolutism, but it's not chaos either. So what is it? It's, it's a world that's open to alteration, rein, reinvention. Reinvention is a great word for the, the history of truth. What happens in the history of truth is that things get reinvented. So the laws of physics get reinvented. The laws of artistic creation get reinvented. But if you... If, if you think that something's absolute, you'll, you won't allow it to be reinvented. So one way to put it, to make it a kind of uh, paradox, is to say the best way to be a conservative is to be a progressive. The worst way to conserve something is to be an absolute, is to be a conservative. If you conserve something absolutely, you'll kill it. If you, if you were absolutely conservative about the intentions of the founders who wrote the Constitution, we would still have slavery. And women wouldn't be allowed to vote. And, you know, in fact, if you didn't own land, you wouldn't be allowed to vote. That would have killed it. So how do you conserve something? By not being conservative. That's great. It sounds like a good political slogan. I may run for office in my retirement. Suzanne, yeah, sure. Going back to your very opening remarks about the being in the age of post-truth, so because there is because there are so many different sources on internet, social media, news outlets, whatever, and especially the political climate we're in, are we losing the ability to even achieve consensus? Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. There are so many in the name of diversity and open information systems. That, that was the hope and the dream of the founders of the internet and of the, and of the first philosophers who, who took a serious look at the internet. Uh, we were going to have open flows of information and it would be impossible for authoritarian regimes to uh, get away with it. We would be able to get into totalitarian countries and just emancipate. People would just say, look, it doesn't have to be this way. But what happened, and to some extent that's true, that has happened, but the, the side effect, which is maybe just as, as large an effect, is, is, is we've lost the capacity for consensus. People don't believe what other people are saying anymore. We don't have an assumption of truth. We don't have a background assumption that when I open my mouth, I'm, I'm attempting to speak the truth. What we've got is a proliferation 
of micro paradigms that, and there's no way to adjudicate them. There's, there's no way to, at this point, I mean, the crisis we're in right now is that there's no way to adjudicate them. Um, so we can't form consensus. We can't, we can't form enough consensus to move forward. So we deadlock or, we, or, or we'll fall into violence. We do fall into violence. Yeah, this, the, 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 you know, the word messenger, or the, the word messenger in, in Greek is, is angelos. So an angel is a messenger. An angel in the, in the scriptures is an instant message system. So if the Bible were written today, you know, God would be communicating with Abraham, you know, with his iPhone, you know, he'd text him, don't slay the, uh, the youth, <laughs> he would just text him that. It's an instant message system. But the one thing we know about the angels, or one of the things we know about the angels, is that they come good and bad. Right? There, there are bad angels. There are the, the high-powered technology of the information age can go bad. And it does. It goes bad with, it's going bad by corrupting uh, information and communication, which is what's happened to us. You know, the word for um, the, uh, there's a Greek myth about the invention of writing. And the inventor of writing goes to the, the king of the Egyptians, it was a Greek story, and says he's invented something that will save the people and, and improve their memories uh, vastly. And he says he's invented writing. So everything now, we can write things down, we won't forget them. And the king says, no, 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 he says, that's going to weaken the people because it's going to destroy what they know by heart and put it into a piece of paper, papyrus, you know, a, a, a technology, you know, a technology. So the invention of writing was like the invention of, te of technology. It was information technology. And the king in this, Pla Plato tells this story, the king says, this, this is terrible. This is a threat. And the word that the, in the, in the myth, the word that the Greek writer uses to say he's invented something that will heal our forgetfulness is the word pharmakon, which translates into English as drug. And so technology, the myth is saying, is a drug that will heal you unless it kills you first. It will heal you, but it may kill you. So it's like a drug that we, <laughs> we don't know whether to use it or not. We need to use it, but we don't know whether we should. So that, and that's what's happened to information technology now. It, it has become um, like Wikipedia. I, I one time, there's a Wikipedia entry on me, and I went in there one time to fix it because there was something that was wrong. And, <laughs> I discovered, I didn't know this, it was 10 years ago. I, if, there's a, if, if there's a Wikipedia entry about you, you're not allowed to touch it because that taints the information. You might be skewing the information. So uh, it's supposed to be a public entry that other people are uh, contributing to. And the idea is, there's, it turns out, I discovered this, I had no idea this was true. There's a whole team of editors in Wikipedia whose job is to prevent f uh, fake news, to, to prevent fake entries, to prevent distortions, to prevent things that are salacious. And also, in, and so in this case, uh, what, what they were suggest uh, worried about with me was that I was trying to taint this, to color, skew this entry about me. So Wikipedia is this, this marvelous public information system that has to be controlled in some way. Because if it's just open, then anything goes. So there are, you, you, you need ways to control public information systems, but you don't want to close them down. You don't want to, don't want to, we don't want to overregulate them. Yeah. So would you say that there's a difference between facts and like 
statistical data? Well, um, yeah, I mean, statistical data would be a species of facts. It would be a kind of fact. You could have other facts that wouldn't be statistical. You could have anecdotal data. That would still be a fact, factual information. And, but it wouldn't be controlled factual information. You, you can, you, statistical information is controlled. There, there are some, when you, there's a whole science called statistics, right? Uh, and the opposite of statistical data is anecdotal data that you just pick up in passing. But they're both cases, instances of facts, and they're both in framework. They're both, in, they're both dependent upon frameworks. And statistics um, can be notoriously skewed. Right? You can you can construct a set of statistics that will prove the worst things, you know, and bit, or hateful things, by construing them in a certain way and collecting only certain information selectively. Um, so no, nothing is safe. Everything is risky. I think that's, I'm, I'm not saying everything is bad or that we're, we're lost, but nothing is safe. So you need, you, need, you need ways to confirm and disconfirm. And you need, uh, you need to keep the systems open, but you need to make sure that uh, it's not just uh, completely arbitrary. Why, why are you worried about statistics? Well, I, you were just saying before how like facts can be interpreted and all facts are interpretable, and I was thinking that statistics can be interpreted in certain ways, but no matter how you interpret it, those numbers are still true. Like, yeah, but you can uh, pick out certain numbers that you prefer. It's sort of like you say, well, isn't scientific research objective? You say, yeah, well, yeah, it's supposed to be, it should be, uh, and, you know, it, it is, but it turns out that what we tend to do in, say, medical research is research things that affect white people rather than black people, men rather than women, Americans rather than somebody else. But the research is serious. But what you've chosen to do to research has been based upon a prior decision, an interpretive framework. only one, if they were only researching one. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It would be, it would be true within the, within it, it would be contextual. And what you, so what you always have to show is, be aware of are the contextual limits on what you've got, the information you've gathered. But it would be true relative to the framework which established it. What does true mean? It means the, the, the most people, the best people, the community of people who work here have settled upon this uh, interpretation. So yeah, it would be true within this context, but there's a multiplicity, there are multiple contexts, and, and whatever has a context can be recontextualized. That's the nature of it. It's like uh, you, you could never say anything that is so true that I couldn't produce a a context in which it's false. I, I often use this when I'm teaching hermeneutics as an example, and I say to the students, well, tell me something that's absolutely true. And I say, well, my name is Stephen. And I say, okay, we're going to have a play, and you're going to play Hamlet. Now, in this play, what's your name? Now, if you say, my name is Stephen, you're wrong. Your name's Hamlet. In that context. There's nothing that's so true that you can't contextual, recontextualize and make it false. But you can't just get, there's nothing, that doesn't undermine truth. It just shows you its contextualizability. It's a, that it depends upon interpretive schema. And what intelligence means is the ability to move among different schemata and to have insight into the way things should be interpreted. So it would, it, it would be wonderful to be a great scientist. 
it would be a mistake to try to interpret everything scientifically. It's wonderful to be a poet, but it would be a mistake to interpret everything poetically. So there, we have multiple interpretive schemata, and we have to be adroit, agile, uh, ambidextrous, able to move be, uh, among them, um, rec rec recognizing, their, recognizing the contextuality of our understandings, and the contingency of our understanding. So everything is risky, but it doesn't mean anything goes. Once you've established that impressionism is the form, then there are better and worse impressionist works. Once you're talking about a, a drama, there are better and worse dramas. Once you're talking about theoretical physics, there are better and worse theories. To say it's only a theory is, a, is to mistake what a theory is. So people say, Evolution is only a theory. That's like saying Einstein is only a genius. Darwin is only a genius. To have a theory, if you ever come up with a scientific theory, Villanova will name a building after you. You'll become famous. It'll have your name on it. Having a theory is very hard. Why? It involves an insight, an interpretation that was unobserved by anyone else. Having an interpretation is, is a blessing. It's a gift. It's not a limit. It is a limit in the sense that it's an angle, but it's the angle that opens things up. So my wish for you, my hope for you, is that you all come up with a theory of something. And nobody will ever, nobody who knows what a theory is will ever say it's only a theory. It's like saying something is, a, is only symbolic. Nobody who knows what a symbol is would ever say it's only a symbol. People kill one another in the name of symbols. And theories are like that. They're, they are insights, they're openings. They're, they, they disclose the truth. There's a philosopher named Heidegger who, who says truth is disclosure. It's opening up something that was closed off. This closure. What does that? Interpretation. You sit there and you look at something and it just doesn't make any sense to you. Somebody comes along, interprets it. What happens? Scales fall off your eyes, the thing opens up. Okay, I think that's probably enough. We're losing our audience and we, I have, they have, I have given them as much truth as they can take. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you.